The Look Alive podcast is sponsored by Sonic. Maria Martin, Alex Glaze here for the Look Alive podcast, and it's been a really busy week at spring training. It's been very hot. The guys are all very excited to be back playing baseball, and I think that one thing that I've noticed being around the Braves so far is that it's World Championship, World Series, or bust. Yeah, definitely, for sure. Um, you know, I think that was the mindset for these guys last year. Um, I think that they really thought they had the team last year, and, and you know, you hear that from the guys we're talking to in the clubhouse. You know, just this this first week, um, they feel the same way. But you know, between injuries and you know, just certain things, the, the way things transpired last year, obviously they, they didn't get it done. So they do have that that bitter taste in their mouth, um, and they are definitely ready to to get out there and get back to work for sure. Yeah, and Brian Snicker did say that the injuries were certainly something that plagued them a lot this season. Should they stay really healthy, it'll be a miracle, obviously. Baseball's a long season, but should they stay consistently pretty healthy, I think they have a really good shot. Well, the other thing too, uh, you know, health obviously a, a big deal, but they have a lot of depth this year as well, depth that they maybe didn't have last year. A lot of younger guys were put into roles maybe that they weren't used to last year. So I think now with that in-game experience, you know, we were talking to guys like um, Sean Newcomb, um, who was in the, the rotation last year uh, because he didn't earn a, a rotation, or in the bullpen last year because he yeah. didn't earn a rotation right. spot. Right. Uh, you know, he wants to, to be up in Atlanta. He doesn't, he, he made it very clear. He doesn't want to be being Gwinnett, whether it's, you know, he wants, to, he, he's going to be competing for one of those rotation spots. But if he doesn't get it, he wants to be in the bullpen because sure. he'd rather be in Atlanta than be in, in, in Gwinnett. But, you know, there's just so many guys that were forced to play spots. I mean, you look at Austin Riley, mm -hmm. how he had to be in the outfield last year. And, you know, it worked out for, for the first month. And then, you know, he went through some growing pains. Um, but, you know, he's back. He's looking great. So I think that the injuries last year really just helped to accelerate the, accelerate the Braves' timetable. Yeah, and I think 2020 has always been the year that you know has been circled. Right. Like they they're going to talk about that. They're, they're going to. It's for the past couple of years. It's been 2020. Right. So they've been ahead of schedule the past couple of years. So this is really the year. And that's what Freddie Freeman said too. He said, if you want to say we were ahead of schedule, then we were. But he did think that they had the team last year, but they didn't get it done, etc. Um, you know. One of the interesting things that we talked about this week was the third base battle. You brought up Austin Riley. Uh, there is an ongoing battle at third base, and that should work itself out here in Florida over the next couple weeks. Johan Camargo shed 17 pounds in the offseason to try to get more athletic. And he looks fantastic. So now that Josh Donaldson is gone, they need a third baseman. It's going to be fun to watch those two guys, Austin Riley and Johan Camargo, duke it out. A absolutely. And the thing is, I mean, the, the big question is going to be, can Johan Camargo get back to 2018 Johan Camargo? Because sure. that was a guy that was, I mean, he was he was great. Um, and Austin Riley, you know, he fixed, you know, some things that he had going on at the plate. His swing looks a lot better. He said he really worked on that in the offseason. He, he really worked on it and, he, and, it, and it shows. So, you know, I think that it's, you, you don't have a bad choice. So the Braves are in a good spot with, with either of them, I, I think. Let's get into the rotation a little bit because Cole Hamels not at Florida yet, although Brian Snicker did say that he would be coming down to Florida. He doesn't know what. He's still rehabbing in Dallas, the shoulder injury that he had in the offseason. But with him not being here, it actually does give some other guys a chance like Sean Newcomb to step up and show that he could potentially end up in Atlanta. There's a battle for that fifth rotation spot. Felix Hernandez, who had an abysmal season in 2019, they got him for a deal here, signed him to a minor league deal. What do we see with this rotation right now and all the competition that's going on? Well, I think that right now the only sure things you have Soroka, you have Freed, you have Fulte. Those three, those are your you, guys. The, you're you're locked into those guys. Uh, Cole, Cole Hamels, if he's healthy, is obviously going to have one of those spots as well. Right. So I think the the fifth spot, I want to see Newcomb take it. Um, he wants to see Newcomb. Take it. Newcomb <laughs> wants to take it. I, uh, Alex Anthopoulos wants to see Newcomb sure. go out and, and take it as well. Um, so the question isn't necessarily, it's just going to be a matter of is Newcomb going to take it? And if he's not, then, you know, like you said, we'll see what uh, Felix Hernandez has. Because he could, Felix could turn into like what Anibal Sanchez was a yeah. couple of years ago. Yeah. I mean, Anibal's a guy nobody's expecting anything right. from, and he comes out and he's 
probably one of the Braves' better pitchers uh, that, that year. Which, let's be honest, a lot of people don't expect a lot from Felix Hernandez. In his heyday, he was one of the best pitchers in the game, spent his whole career in the Mar with the Mariners, then he came over to Atlanta. So I think it kind of benefits him that no one really expects him to do anything. Well, yeah, there's no, there's no pressure. Right. So, you know, if he, comes out, if he comes out and he looks great, he looks great. If he comes out and he doesn't, then it's, you know, well, you get what you pay for in, in a sense. You know what I mean? So you really don't know what you're going to get with, with him. So I think that there is no pressure. Yeah. Let's talk about Fulte for a second. Okay. Uh, one thing that we all noticed and we were all kind of holding our breath over is when Marcelo Zuna arrived, they kind of crossed, looked at each other across the clubhouse. So you saw, you, yeah, okay. so really it was more Fulte than Ozuna. Ozuna didn't really give him any looks, but Fulte kind of looked and then walked away. And I don't know if there's been, I'm sure there's been an interaction at some point now to this point, but he's definitely backed off a little bit when he sees him walking to the clubhouse. Um, I don't know if you're, if you're saying if, you, if that's how you're describing it. There might not have been an interaction because no, I'm saying that we didn't see. Oh no, no, no I know, and I'm telling Maybe you, there's that not. I, I, Ozuna is <laughs> alpha male times twenty, so sure. you you definitely have to approach him. Yeah, and I don't and know that Fulty did that. And I don't think right. Fulty is approaching him. And you know, no disrespect to to, to Mike Fultonevich at all, but I I don't think what's he gonna do? Is he gonna yeah, go up what and are you gonna say? yeah? I mean, so there's nothing to just say. seeing Ozuna come in, it's, it's also interesting because he he. He, he's been coming in from the opposite side of the clubhouse. So he'll say hi to guys like Luke Jackson, Dansby, Charlie Culberson. He's also trying to learn names. So he's calling them out by their, their full. He's like, hey, Charlie, hey, you know, yeah. Luke, you know. So he's trying to learn names. But he's kind of stayed away. I don't think I've seen him on yeah. Fulte's side of the clubhouse. So yeah. that that is interesting. You did get to talk to Fulte, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to Fulte about a, a lot of stuff. You know, obviously, um, Braves fans still probably feeling some type of way about the way last season ended. Uh, game five, ten runnings in an inning, not ideal sure. um, at all. But, you know, I think Fulte gets a bad rap to me. I, I, I get it. He, he's an emotional guy, but I'm an emotional guy. I get it. You know what I mean? So, I, I under, uh, Fulte, I understand you. You know what I mean? But uh, here's, the, here's the funny thing, too, and, and we'll get into this interview in a second. But fans have been chirping at him all off season yep. uh, online, and he just – takes it and you know recently he's gotten on social media and he's kind of been throwing it back in some people's faces personally as you'll hear when I'm talking to him I love that stuff you know if you know me at all I'm a I'm a chirper myself uh, but I can also give take and respect it so uh, Braves fans have been giving it to him and maybe rightfully so so I think Fulte he still wears the the bracelet yep. you know yeah. and, if you, and if you are a Braves fan you know what the bracelet says <laughs> And he's out to prove that he kind of has his things figured out and he's ready to have a big year. Quick offseason for you. So how are you feeling coming back? Um, feeling pretty good. Uh, so like you said, offseasons are always, are always quick and short, especially when January comes around. Um, with this new, faci new facility, I mean, guys are eager to come on down here, um, get it going, and um, you know, just kind of get that, that better taste out of, out of your mouth from last year. And, um, um, get ready for this 2020 season. So it's been it's been a fun few days already so far. Did you come down here at all during the off season before you guys had to? Um, no, I just got here, um, you know, probably a week before our actual uh, report date. You know, just kind of get the area, get used to the area. You know, we haven't been down here yet. Um, not much to do. Get used to the sun. <laughs> exactly, not much to do. Yeah, it gets hot really, really quick in the morning. It's a little different from Orlando. Um, but like I said, just the, the vibes around here have been have been great. Um, that translates to winning. Uh, so we'll just keep that up, you know, position players get here in a, in a few short days and, um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of get this energy going and, you know, get ready for the season. You're talking about that bitter taste you guys had in your mouth after last season. You specifically, though, with, with the way things transpired, just how did you process all of that this offseason? How long did it take you to kind of flush it and get move on? Um, I mean, I was over with it, you know, within a few days. Uh, you know, but you know, people let me know every single day, so you know it's kind of <laughs> kind of hard to forget. But uh, you know, I was, you know, I slept it off. Like I said, I woke up to my family the next day. Um, they helped me out tremendously. I'm not, well, not only through the course of the year, um, like you said, but just you know, they've been there. We lived it. I get it. So uh, you know, they were big, big support system for You're me. You're saying people are letting you know? Is this like it's, people chirping at you on like the grocery store on, no, on social no, media? Just, like, yeah, I mean, it's just social media. You know, you just can't. There's no way around it, um, you know, this day and age. But yeah, I mean, I got, you know, I slept it off. You know, I was had to be a father the next day. I had to, get, you know, just take my kid to school. Um, I had to do all that fun stuff. Uh, so I mean, life moves on, man. He's like, I got in this in this game. I had to learn to, uh, 
you know, a lot of negative stuff throw it away, kind of work on the positive, build off the positive stuff. Um, and stuff happens <laughs> you know, at the end of the day. So uh, I have to get ready for a 2020 season. You know, we got the same goal this year is to try to win that, that World Series. And um, you know, that, that experience from you know, not only last year, but the year before, you know, only made me better, you know, made my teammates better. Um, and so we kind of know what to expect this, this year. But sometimes you got to let the trolls know. I saw <laughs> yeah, you on yeah, Instagram no, no, the other day. No, I saw like that. Said, I, lo we, I uh, like that. I like that, by the way. Um, sometimes you got to let them know. We can't. We can't be walked on 24/7 like they're. You know, Sometimes, like about. you know, you probably get thousands, and then there's just one that you're just like, yeah, all right, that's, no, that's a straw. We're human beings too. Um, you know, like I said, if you scroll and see something at a certain time, or you know, you're just out of line a little bit. You know, you just you got sitting be, in your locker, you feet are up. You're like, all right, now my, my kids are sleeping. You know, I'm on. You know, I, sometimes I have time. You know, I'm not. <laughs> you know, I'm not at work 24/7. Um, like I said, but we're human beings too. And um, you know, I, I don't, I don't live in the past. I might have, I might have in the past, lived in the past, but I don't anymore. Um, you know, this is, we have to kind of spread a positive world these days, and um, it's, it's a negative world. So I mean, there's, there's a lot of good people out in the world that, uh, you know, that helped me through it. I mean, I've had a tremendous amount of fans give me so much support, um, over 500 messages of, you know, support, <laughs> you know, in a couple of days. Um, from Braves fans, so it's just it's been amazing, um, you know, about social media and the negativity. It's just you know, the world we live in today. It's it's unfortunate, but you know, um, we get through it. Yeah, and uh, you know, last year was kind of a, it's a weird year for you. Started off with the injury, yeah, dealing yeah. with things in Gwinnett, come up, have a good year. Mm -hmm. Just kind of, what are you looking to? What can you take from last year and apply to this year? And what do you? What, what kind of things have you been working on to take your game to the next level this year? It was just, yeah, like you said, man, long year. Um, last year I had to figure a lot of things out. Um, what were you trying to figure going, out? Going through ups and downs, just you know, figure out where my slider was. Um, I said my elbow hurt a little bit, and uh, you know, just kind of have to get through those pains and, and sorenesses and toughnesses, and uh, you know, whatever it may be. And um, yeah, I just have to go out there and be mentally tough too, and and kind of at the end of the day, say screw it, just go out and pitch your game. You know, if something happens, it happens, and I'll get it taken care of. You know, but uh, you know, I just kind of said all those things, went out and and dominated, and you know, did what I did. You know, my kind of 2018 season and, you know, was a better pitcher there at the second half of the season. Um, but this year is just the main goal is to stay healthy, you know, so I don't have to play catch up like I have in the past during spring trainings. Um, you know, I'm just going to listen to my body a lot better this year and um, just really be smart um, with the arm and, and just go from there. With the one-year deal, does this kind of feel like a prove-it year for you a little bit? Um, a little bit. Uh, like I said, every year, is, you know, on those one years, you kind of bet on yourself a little bit. Um, you know, but that's the confidence you have to have in this game. Um, at the end of the day, you're not going to worry about you no know, contracts or money or anything, and you're just going to go out there and um, do my thing and <laughs> go out there and perform the way I know I can, and, and that'll take care of all the other stuff um, at the end of the day. But uh, this is a great team, um, great friends, great pitching staff, um, great everything. So this is going to be a fun year for us, and you know, we're just all, we're all excited to get that better taste out of our mouth and, and get that World Series in 2020. <laughs> I like Folsy. Yeah, I, I like him too. I think he gets a bad rap. You understand that now? I mean, I, yeah, I people do. people want their pitchers to be so just emotionless. And right. listen, at the end of the day, we're all humans. It's true, and I think that he's probably the most emotional in the clubhouse of, of all the pitchers. Um, but he speaks it like it is, and I think that you can respect that too. I mean, it's a long off season for baseball, and especially long for him when all he gets is tweets and Instagram messages and everything. So he's been having to deal with that ever since Game Five happened. Ever since he walked off the mound, those messages were flooding in. So I like that he's just kind of owning it, chirping back at fans, um, and he definitely feels like he has something to prove. Absolutely, on that one-year deal, and he says it's a prove-it deal. And I listen. I like that. I like that. Some other guys that are out to prove themselves, uh, the younger guys, are, there are a lot of young guys on this this team. Uh, you know, when we say young guys, you know, you just I automatically think of how guys got their opportunities up here. You know, when you think Austin Riley, he kind of forced Alex Anthopoulos in the Braves' hand. He was doing so well in Gwinnett. You almost had to find a reason to get him up, up, up here. Uh, unfortunately, injuries happened, and he that's how he, he got up. But... You know, there, there are just so many of those guys that could be taking that next step this year. Yeah, and Kyle Wright is actually one of them that I think a lot of people have circled that could make an appearance in Atlanta at some point this season. That speaks about the depth 
to this team and what Alex Anthopoulos and, and crew are trying to do in Atlanta. They're trying to bring a lot of young guys in, um, a lot of very talented guys, Kyle Wright being one of the guys that is extremely talented. But when I talked to Tuki Tucson, he said, look, there's so many of us that are competing for so many spots all over the field. It's completely crowded, but that's a good problem to have. And, you know, with baseball, a lot of the times, guys that deserve to be in the majors will hang out in the minors for a long stretch of time because there's no room. And I think that's a good problem for the Braves to have at this point. But it could be a benefit to the Braves because if some of these veterans need a couple days of rest, they're slipping up a little bit. Uh, you pull a young guy up from Gwinnett and everybody's happy for a couple days. Absolutely. And you know, I'm not going to name names here, but just being in the clubhouse and talking to some of the guys, you know, I did ask one of these younger guys, what's, what's it like to be in an organization like the Braves, because they get a bad rep um, for for not making major moves in the sure. offseason, not spending, not giving up prospects. Sure. And, you know, as I, I talked to a guy who's one of those prospects, and I'm like, what does that do for you mentally? Because I'm sure you have friends who don't know where they're going to be from year to year because they're playing in AAA. They might, not, they might be one of those fringe guys. And, and what that does for you, and they told me that it actually gives them a lot more confidence because they feel like they're being groomed for a role rather than being viewed as just another prospect. And that's kind of an interesting way. I never looked at it that way. Yeah, I think that's super interesting. You know, I've never heard it put that way. Um, so especially when a guy is hanging out in AAA for so long, if you're telling them that you're going to spend a bunch of money in the offseason and give away all these prospects, I can see how that would be kind of deflating. So that just goes to show you that the Braves value every move that they're making. No, they don't spend money a ton of the time. They, they watch Josh Donaldson go, but they want to reap the benefits of bringing these young guys up. And, and you see, when you walk around the clubhouse, there are so many faces in that clubhouse that you've probably never seen before. And you will at some point. Uh, it's so loaded. They're going to be so deep. And I think that that should give Braves fans a sense of comfort. Absolutely. And, you know, just the fact that you are being groomed for something specific for the Braves and when they come out and they want you they they have plans for you that obviously does something for you as well one of those guys that I that I did talk to is Drew Waters um, if you are a baseball fan around Atlanta you probably know the name he went to Etowah High School graduated in 2017 uh, was the 41st pick look I'm doing this off the top of my head I think he was the 41st pick in the uh, in the in the 2017 uh, draft you know obviously big year for him last year made it up to Gwinnett and he's got some big plans for this year. All right, Drew, so, you know, a lot of people are expecting this maybe to be the year for you to take your game to that next level. Maybe this is the year for you. Do, do, you, do you kind of feel that? You know, um, obviously my end goal is to finish in Truist Park and help the Atlanta Braves win a World Series. But um, This year? Yeah, this year. And I'm just... You know, at the end of the day, that's my goal. But I think my uh, my more of a goal now is just having competitive at bats, all spring training, and then getting off to a good start at the beginning of the season, and then see where things go. Really strong year last year. How did you feel going into the off season, and kind of what were the, some of the things that you were working on to take your game to that that next level to get you at Truist Park? You know, I um, every year I. At the end of the year, I evaluate kind of what I did really well and what I need to work on. And um, it was good. I got the opportunity to play in AAA last year. And um, I didn't have as much success as I would have liked. But um, I really valued my time there just because it allowed me to really like learn what I needed to work on and what I needed to do to not only compete with those guys at the AAA level, but to also um, make an impact at the big league level. So you're saying you, you, you make that evaluation list. What were some of those things that were on, the things you did well, and what were some of the things that you worked on? Um, well, one thing is is hitting from the right side of the plate. Um, from the left side, I, I think I hit 330, and then from the right side, it was more of a 260. And, um, you know, I just want to make it to where either I'm hitting – for average from the right side or hitting for power, but it's got to be one or the other or both. So that was my main focus going into this off season was, okay, what can I do to make my right side, you know, late in the game, they're not bringing in a lefty, they're keeping the righty on the mound. I still want to be able to feel like a threat from the right side of the plate. Look like you put on some weight too. That's definitely another thing. Um, I think it's like anything, when you're strong, everything becomes just a little bit easier. So. Um, each off season, especially 
while I'm young, um, just continue to try to get stronger and quicker. And, you know, I think it'll be exciting to see how it plays this year. You know, being a hometown guy, what kind of unique pressures kind of come along with, with that? I mean, um, when you make one, when you make your debut, um, it's not going to be like everybody else's. Um, just playing. More special. Yeah, playing in AAA. I would show out uh, in the game and there would be 100 people there after the game at a AAA game. So the thought of me making my big league debut so close to home, I'm excited to not only have my family and my support system there, but also be able to play in front of my friends and some of the people I grew up in front of. Have you talked to guys like Dansby and Charlie about what that what that means and kind of what they were going through during, during that time for them? I've talked to them a little bit. Um, you know, other guys like that that I've talked to is Jeff Francoeur, um, Brian McCann, just some of those guys that, you know, grew up in the Atlanta area and had the opportunity of making their debut in front of their hometown crowd. And um, I think they all did a great job. So being able to really watch them and look at how they handled themselves in that situation, I'm definitely looking to feed off that this year. You can tell by just that interview, he's a really cool guy, but I saw him actually in the outfield with fans. You know, those fans come down every single day. They're allowed to, you know, get autographs and all that stuff. He took his gloves off and gave it to a little boy, and his face was just incredible, and I think that it's good to get his gloves now because you might see him in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, I don't think he'll be giving away his gloves in a couple of years. But, yes, I, I mean, that's obviously something really cool, and that's something that that kid's never going to forget and something that he probably has a lifelong fan now in, in, uh, in that kid. Yeah, that's one thing, a benefit of spring training if you're a fan to come down here. You get a little bit closer access than you would during the regular season. One club that's having a terrible time with all access right now is the Astros, and they are – the focal point of spring training for a lot of people. You know, a lot of players across the league have been asked their reaction um, during spring training, and we had one that had a very colorful opinion. Really, we haven't talked about the Astros since we've been here. No, I think uh, Freddie Freeman was asked about it, and really, I mean, Nick Markakis is the other uh, player that, that was asked about it, but you know, we had Rob Manfred here, and Rob Manfred was here, and obviously he he got a lot of questions from national media about, about that. But what's really interesting, too, is just last year, two of the guys that were on that 2017 Astros team were in yeah. the Braves clubhouse, Dallas Keuchel and Brian McCann. Brian McCann, obviously a, a, a Braves legend. Um, so very interesting to hear Nick's comments when you think of it in the context of these are guys that were in the clubhouse last year. And Nick Markakis is a guy that played the game the right way, he's done it for a long time, been in a lot of, or not, no, only been in two clubhouses. Yep. And there's a reason for that because he is such a, a pillar. He is just one of those guys that is gonna just come to work every day, you know what you're gonna get, you know what you can expect, and he leads by example. So for him to speak the way that he spoke the other day, I've never heard Nick, in my three years being here, speak that way about anything. It was crazy. Yeah, and I'm new, but when we were sitting in the clubhouse, listening to him talk about the Astros, it kind of took me back for a second. Hold on, because I'll, I'll say it, I'll say it. But going in, you know, I'm kind of trying to help you out, give you the lay of the land, like right. tell you who's who. And, you know, when we were going in and, and we haven't gotten to Marquecas, I'm like, oh, don't even worry about Marquecas. He's not going to say anything. You know what I mean? I, I literally, you know, because I can't think of, maybe I can count on one hand the amount of good sound bites I've gotten from Nick or the amount of times that we've talked to Nick, because it's just one of those things right. where, you don't just go up to him to get news of the day stuff. If you're going up to talk to Mark Kakis, you're There's going up reason. to talk to him for a reason. Sure. And, I, I, you know, before he even started talking about the Astros stuff, he was kind of quiet. I mean, he didn't really have much to say. He just put in the work in the offseason. He was here to do the work like he does every year. He's a utility player, wants to be in whatever role the Braves want him to be in. And then the Astros got bro brought up. I was not expecting a three-minute monologue. No, but that's what but that's what we got, and it was three minutes. It was epic. <laughs> it was unbelievable, and I was shifting my eyes a little bit as soon as he would drop these nuggets that you'll hear in a second. Um, but that goes to show you that it really does infuriate the players that have done it the right way. When you show up to work every day, you're 36 years old, and you put in all these years in Major League Baseball, you're frustrated. Um, and his comments were really poignant. He didn't call anyone out by name, but I'm sure he feels something very strongly towards Keichel and McCann. Uh, but I want you to listen to these comments and listen to them very closely because this is surprising for, for everyone, especially fans of the Braves. It angers you, um, especially from a guy who has played the game the right way his whole career. Um, no shortcuts. 
Um, I know how hard this game is. I know how hard uh, preparing for this game is, and to uh, um, to see something like that is it's it's damaging to baseball. Um, you know, it, it's anger. Uh, I feel like every single guy over there needs a beating. Um, you know, it's, it's wrong. They're messing with people's careers. Um, you know, I know we're all competitive and we're all we're out there competing, but there's right ways to do it and wrong ways to do it. And uh, I 100% disagree with the way they did it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people uh, that were hurt by it, um, and it was wrong. And I, th I think the punishment and everything, I think just everything has been taken, everything's been handled the wrong way. Um, you know, you got two guys that are sitting at home that you can kind of, you know, give them a little bit of leeway, um, and they're not they're not in the game right now. And then you got uh, the players who did it who are, are, are scot free. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of political stuff behind it, but uh, you know it's wrong. You don't want to see that. Um, you know, everybody's out there competing and trying to do things the right way. And when you got guys like that, it's uh, it's pretty sad. Um, you know, those guys have a lot of talent over there, but to take it to that level is uh, is wrong. You know, it's um, I know as players we we do not agree with what they did. We don't stand behind them, and never will we support them um, for their actions. And I think uh, I think they got off uh, they got off pretty easy. Um, you know, they're going to be able to go out there and compete with no ramifications at all, which is wrong. And I think the commissioner completely handled it the wrong way. Um, but, you know, that's the way he did it. And, you know, that's the way we got to live with it. But, uh, you know, I know a lot of people disagree with him. And uh, the way he handled the situation, he should be embarrassed of himself. Nick, the way the fact that guys from Cody Bellinger to Mike Trout to, you know, Freddie, it seems like a unified voice in condemning. Yeah, absolutely. This. You know, what they did was bullshit. Um, you know, they took a lot of uh, opportunities away from people and, uh, you know, possibly ruined people's careers. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're all competitive in this and, you know, we want to compete and win. But when you take it to that level, I mean, there's no excuse. It's, uh, like I said, bullshit. And, you know, they should, uh, they should have some uh, ramification on what they did. Okay, so instant reaction is, oh, my gosh. I think as soon as he was done speaking, all of us kind of looked around and we were like, did he really just say half of what he said? As soon as he said that everybody over there deserves a beating, yeah. I think that's when I kind of I, I kind of looked up because you know first you know you know how it is you're just standing there holding the mic you're just sure. looking around kind of you're listening but kind of you're like I'm planning on just listening to it back and you're listening for for hot words. As soon as he said beating, everyone just kind of looked up. Everyone perked up. And. You know, that just goes to show you that Nick feels very passionately about this. His lip was quivering the entire time. I've never seen him uh, as emotional speaking about something as he was today. He was really... Yeah, the, yeah, when he spoke. <laughs> Not today, but you know what I mean. Right, and you know, he was, I mean, he was frustrated. He was visibly frustrated, like you talked about, and I think he has every right to be. Brian Snicker was asked about it. He didn't hear the comments. Uh, they were on Twitter. They went viral. Well, hold on. So, so Dusty Baker also didn't hear the comments, but a, a reporter did bring them up. And Dusty, Dusty was a little bit more opinionated than Snick. Well, well, he, he, it's funny because he started off by saying, "No, nah, I'm not, and I'm not going to comment on someone else's comments." Right. But you said Markakis said it. Markakis doesn't say anything, and the reporter goes, "That's right." And then he asked if he said, "Well, Markakis must have ate, ate his Wheaties today," and that's, I mean, so. Firing a shot back. I mean, that's an, a bold strategy. Uh, it's it's going to be a really interesting baseball season. I, I'm here for it. Um, it's going to be really interesting. I don't know how this this whole thing is going to play out, but I don't think it's going to go well. I think that this is all bad for baseball. Yeah. And the last thing baseball needs right now is more bad things. Yeah, and look, it's natural for the guys to chirp at each other during a game. They do it all the time this in is, passing, but this, this is, is different. different. This is this is very different, and um, I think that you're really going to see that with Astros players, especially when you hear from a guy like Nick Markakis, who said, I've lost respect for everybody Mike on that Trout. team. Mike Trout, too. When Mike Trout, who also does not. You, these are guys you never hear from. So when you have these kind of guys speaking out, you know it's bad.
And, and that's what I want people to remember is we already knew the sign stealing scandal was a big deal. We've blown it up. We're talking about it forever. But when we start to hear from the guys that we don't hear from, I think is when it really hits wow, this might be a season long thing. And I just want to finish on, on one note here because sure. I think the most important thing, the thing that everyone heard was the beating and everyone's worried about how the Astros are going to be treated this year. And, you know, Rob Manfred is talking about no retaliation and how there are going to be strict punishments for, for, for uh, pitchers that throw at players this year. But the thing that Nick brought up that I think is the most important thing is how this affects guys and the trajectory of their career. Yeah. Think of a, a, a pitcher who's getting his first shot at, at the big leagues and he's going up against the Astros and gets rocked and that changes his entire trajectory of his career. Or you have guys like Aaron Judge who maybe you could argue got robbed of an MVP as a result of this scandal. Right. That is something that in future contract negotiations is going to cost him money. You have teams that maybe had a shot at playoffs or World Series or All-Star or, you know, things of that nature. And that affects people's pockets. And then you have those players, again, that are those fringe guys that are affected by all this. So I think that that, that was the most important stuff yeah. that I, I don't think enough people are talking about. There's a whole lot of smaller, not big name baseball players that were really affected by this that probably, I, I don't know, that, that maybe never recovered from it. Yeah, and I think that we're going to see that transpire this year, how bad this truly is and was for baseball. You're really going to see that the Astros really did affect not just themselves, but really the entire league. It, it has been such a great week here in Northport, Florida for spring training. The Braves, high expectations for the season. We'll be back next week with more on the Look Alive podcast, and you can download it wherever you get your podcasts. The Look Alive podcast is sponsored by Sonic.